Hey guys, welcome to our the first make podcast. Um, this is our first attempt at this. Uh, obviously, we have our founders here, um, Mr. Andreas and Mr. Drew. Um, so, what's the happiest thing that's happened this week? What's the check-in? Yeah. Oh, best thing that happened this week. It's it's, it's, check-in. it's, 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 <laughs> it's Tuesday, so it's an early, it's early on. That's true. Um, <laughs> or maybe from last week. Uh, my favorite NFL team won their game against the Detroit Lions, so I'm pretty happy. It was a scrape by, but that'll, that's that's a win for me. And I got to go shopping with my kid on Sunday, so that's good. So you skipped um, football and to watch American football? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a weird Brit. <laughs> Very weird Brit. Um, but, <laughs> you're, well, you're welcome. Uh, there's more where that came from. So it's, yeah. <laughs> um, Happiest moment for me, um, I got to take my kids to see the new Disney movie. That's always a fun oh, thing. Uh, Although uh, the, the movie was a bit of a disappointment, I think, but um, it was fun. I was I was reading it. It was a really expensive movie to make, apparently. Pardon. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was uh, working on the name card that you suggested yesterday. That was fun. I, I actually had fun <laughs> doing that. You did it really quick. I just mentioned, yeah. hey, you need a name card. He goes, oh yeah. And then this morning, just paste it in Slack. And I'm like, who did this? That's pretty good. <laughs> So 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 I'm I'm Andreas and he's he's Andrew. But who are you then? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 This is Sky. Uh, I'm Sky, and I'm one of the worker bees here in Make. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also the CEO of Pareto. Uh, we'll talk about Pareto in a little bit, um, which is part of what Make is doing. So, shall we start? Yeah. So now the serious questions is coming. So how did you meet and when did you start Make? Well. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it does sound like Ice uh, broken. <laughs> yeah, but you, 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 um, you, you, you can tell a story of, of how, how we met. <laughs> okay. Um, well, one day long, no. So, so basically I was, I was looking at LinkedIn and uh, LinkedIn back in the days, this was uh, 2007, I think it was, uh, 2008, just introduced um, a feature called Groups. And this chap here posted into a new group, I think it was a bar camp Bangkok, looking for a co-working space. And he had the job title of Web Strategist. <laughs> so, and I thought that was really impressive, like, I've got to get this guy in the office. That's, 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 that's called category creation. Yes. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I just had to reach out to him. I responded to his um, his request, his ad, and uh, he responded. And we we met at All Seasons uh, Place in front of Starbucks. I remember the day. <laughs> well, that's where the office was. Yeah. Uh, well, and he was just sitting at a round table like this with a book in his hand. I don't remember what you're reading. And I think um, Jane was walking around somewhere. And then we we just spoke. And I thought it would be like a quick half an hour chat but it we we sat and talked for a while and and, and then i moved in <laughs> that, was, that was a bit too quick though <laughs> did you have dinner no but no but seriously like the, the um i think well, initially i was looking for a place to rent a desk for a few weeks but then then well I, and i ended up renting a desk from you and then a few weeks later you, you hired me and then i worked for you for months a, later a month later <laughs> months later oh and, and, and you're skipping but, a few beats yeah, yeah but then, then, then yeah, maybe um work fast um <laughs> but then uh i ended up working for you for a while um mm. until until make came into being because this was this was pre pre make no? it was before make came was into there being. a company name for this pre make organization w- w- well, well, there was, but yeah. but this was a this was a you were running the software development arm of a UK design agency. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's that's what and we, we did. needed a project manager, and right. he had the skill set for it, and I had to borrow it for a little while, <laughs> with the intention of making it longer term. Right. And and but but this you guys were in Thailand, Bangkok at the time, right? Yes. Okay. So 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 uh, yes, in in Bangkok, this was. Two th- yes, like I said, 2008-ish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you were guys you were back for many years already, and then. Wait, were you were you moved here when? 2006. Right. Okay. So that was been about a year and a bit. It must have been 2008, right? When we came when you came by, I think 2008. Yeah, I'm, I moved here in 2008, 2009. Yeah. And and that's when. So when did you start making in that timeline? 
Well, um, I think Andreas. So, so the previous company was running about three years, and uh, Andreas joined about I think about halfway through uh, two thousand eight or two thousand nine, um, and then basically um, was a bit weary of of the work that we had and wanted to sort of move on. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Don't don't go. <laughs> and uh, at home, they'd already been sort of pushing me uh, to open up my own company. And um, you know, we had taken the current company uh, up to ten people over three years, and it was it's kind of a bit slow. Um, and it's just the way it was at the time. So um, I decided, to, okay, maybe now it's time to to make a break for it. So I said, hey, why don't we do something? You know, and um, we we think alike. We we believe in people. We want to you know do all sorts of things better, uh, including the way we treat the people, the, the output of our work, how we do the work. And uh, went all right then. One thing led to another. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So 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 make make was founded in uh, December 2011 or Jan. I think technically maybe the paperwork came through in January 2012. But so, so it's, it's been it's been ten years. Yeah. yeah the premise behind. Um, well, it wasn't called Make at the time. Um, we were very big on honesty and passion, right? So we said, hey, why don't we call the business Frank? <laughs> and um, and we thought, yeah, we were riffing off like passion and Frank. We had all this list of like different ways we could connect the word Frank to other words. Um, and then we took it to the the ten folks that we had we that we were working with at the time, saying, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna open up a new company, and this is what we're gonna call." We had everybody in the room, meeting room, right? <laughs> and then we're gonna call it Frank. And then you could hear the crickets, <laughs> and we're like, "Oh crap! What what did we do?" Yeah, and then someone's like, like "That's a stupid name." <laughs> it's like, "Okay, that's a Frank answer." Yeah, so that's yeah, a, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, we lived up to the to the to the name, yeah. Um, but yeah, so 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 the, the the name make came into being f- through that. We we still debate to this day how it came about. You say it, well, I, I did it, but I I don't know if that's uh, yeah okay. Uh, I take take credit for it. So and actually, if, if someone at home is wondering what M A Q E sounds like, it is make. Yeah. It's just <laughs> it's just spelled weirdly. Why? Because M A K E dot com was taken. <laughs> M A Q E was available. Yeah. Uh, sort of. Yeah. Hands, didn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's an odd spelling, but a very good URL for um, SEO purposes. Yep. Four letter domain, yeah. make, not make, not makaka, <laughs> not make, make, make with a Q. Yes. So, but why did you decide to start a company? Like you, you already had a company or a brand you were working with. Why did you start a new one completely? Well, I think. For for me, it was about it was pressure from home as well, and then maybe the desire to be able to push faster and uh, in the way that maybe I wanted to to work. And um, having having Andreas there as well was was just fortuitous timing. I think it was just the the right time and right person. So <clears throat> the the jump wasn't too difficult. Actually, I I wasn't intending to do it so fast. Actually, the previous, my previous boss, I had actually told him like, you know, we'll, I'll, we'll take some time. I'm going to quit. I'm going to do my own thing. This is pressure from home, blah, blah, blah. I'm, uh, I want to set up my own company and, and roll my own way. And I said, oh, maybe it'll take about six months, a year. And then um, uh, about a few weeks later, he sort of okayed it. And then uh, Basically, he wasn't able to send any more money the next month, so we had to rapidly uh, uh, inc- increase our, our efforts to get the company set up before we we uh, uh, we lost the people. So we had to hold on to them so we could make make a move. Yeah. So so in, in so in a way, we ha- our, our hand was forced there too. So and, and initially there wasn't any um, there, w- there weren't any grand plans. Uh, it was just like we 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 wanted to keep working together. And this was a way for us to do that. Didn't make but a plan. You you wrote um, a small business um, proposal, a plan. Yeah, yes, but it was very pragmatic and practical. The, the whole the whole you know mission, vision, all that stuff came later in 2016. So, wow. so so initially it was it was basically how do we how do we just keep this going for now, uh, and then the the big picture started dawning on us a bit later when we realized how much work it was to build an organization. Because <laughs> it wasn't as easy as you might have thought. You know? it is not. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember what you wrote in it? I, what it? Because basically that business proposal triggered our Swedish investors to come over. 
right? Because yeah. because at, at this at at, at at today, so Drew and I own 80, 75, 80 percent of the company, and then we have uh, um, uh, a company out of Sweden that that invested early on, uh, and we, we we did a lot of work for them initially, um, and and they they um, they bought in based on that first. I don't. I. I don't know if can we even call it a business plan. I don't know if th- that actually qualifies. But it was, you know, um, it was a couple it, of pages. It was good enough, apparently. Yeah. So, yeah. It, good enough for them to read it, and then within two weeks they flew over. They were that serious about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, or it was like, hey, business pro- proposal plus Thailand. Oh, phew. best investors ever. Hmm. So, in 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 that sense, um, from from forcing your hand to start a company and to, to be able to work together from then until now like has what make does change like what does actually make what does make actually do has it changed over time it, it, it has changed a lot i think like uh, as as most companies we've we've um gone through several transitions um from you know if, if we if we divide the company if we divide the timeline the 10 years into into two just to simplify things the first five years was very heavy on engineering, working almost exclusively with startups in Europe. And then the, the second half has been uh, commerce focused, working m- m- almost exclusively with big companies in Southeast Asia. And then, you know, there's a transition between the two, etc. But but uh, what we do for customers has changed quite a, a lot during that time. Um, and so, you know, at the, at, the, at the beginning of it, it was basically like we build stuff. Um, and nowadays, it's, it, yeah, yeah, literally, like, like, it, and it could be anything. Um, today, it's more focused on commerce, but it's actually in, in, in a broad perspective in terms of not just web stores and marketplaces, but um, even stretching into how you go about doing it from, from uh, you know, teaching agile and OKRs or, or design thinking or whatever. So there's, there's a, sort of a, 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 our repertoire has become a lot broader as we've grown. We build anything, but <laughs> um, we have focused on commerce. And uh, to put it as uh, as it was well written by somebody, uh, we help our customers sell more, and by any which way we can. But that usually means building an e-commerce website that um, is above the uh, above average. I would say that's true. Like we we do we do help companies sell more. Um, Primarily, like you said, through through custom built software, it could be a it could be a web store, it could be a marketplace, it could be an O two O solution, um, but but the emphasis is always on on custom unmet needs. It's about tailoring it to the the unique idiosyncrasies of the company itself, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, so that we can create an experience that is is beyond what what's otherwise out there so so focusing on on a conversion as opposed to just building stuff yeah. so so previous clients had a, had issues with previous vendors not being able to either fully build what they have wanted so uh one client of ours uh, is selling a distributor for garmin watches went through three vendors couldn't quite get it right and so basically we we offered to and suggested to build uh, a custom built commerce site to handle the products that they had, design it well so the experience was really, really good, uh, easier to use, uh, not just for them, but also for their, their staff. Their staff had to set up promotions. Uh, it had to manage, uh, I think, some of the integrations with, I think, uh, a third party, I think uh, uh, an insurance company, because, you know, Garmin running watches plus uh, insurance was a good fit. And um, and basically complete the experience, which was being able to buy really quickly, pay online through an integration with a payment gateway, uh, delivery, and uh, the integration with this um, third party system as well. And we make it easier. That's, that's the point. Yeah, a, a lot of these things are incredibly complicated under the hood, but but a lot of effort goes into making the customer experience as easy as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, to to the point where where sometimes it looks so simple when you when it's done that that you're like there has to be more to it, you know. Yeah. But no, the the the, <clears throat> the, the complexity is under the hood. I think in hindsight, I think having now helped one really large IT client um, build their e-commerce website as a custom build and versus what we used to do a couple of years back at the very beginning, um, it's it's quite a different beast and it's a quite understandable why it's not easily 
executed by by some agencies because you know you do need to have a level of technical chops you do need to have a very good eye for detail and the experience you need to integrate really well uh, with these third party systems if it's not delivery it's you know or th- you know th- third party logistics repls payment gateways um, tracking so so um, certain clients will have uh, user analytics, so you know GA, Google Analytics, uh, and it's not just the simple stuff. It's actually, you know, the Google Tag Managers and uh, event tracking. And it's the next level up of tracking, which we don't have that expertise. But then we're that you know our clients work with the experts directly, and therefore they advise us, and we get to learn as well at the same time. So you know, um, tracking the right information so that they can they know what they're converting, what they're not converting where the drop-offs are Um, and you know from that we can help actually give them uh, experience uh, consultation so what the designers will say okay well if if a customer wants to do an O2O purchase well here's the entry points this is the pickup well this is what we need to do to make sure that they don't have to click all over the place they can choose a branch to do a pickup and they can still buy relatively quickly and then the rest of it is these are clients operations they take care of it so there's a lot going on at, at a bigger level that is underappreciated by certain clients that are new <laughs> or maybe they are experienced but haven't gone the next level, which, you know, we've been in business 10 years and, you know, um, we've seen a lot, I think. There, you know, I think we're at one point we were talking, this is not commerce, but we were talking to um, um, a client that was a bank and we were being, uh, we were discussing redesigning a, a mobile banking app for them. This is years back, and the client asked me, "Have you done this before, a banking app?" And we had, I said, "No." And then she was like, "Well, how 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 do I know you're good at this if you've never done this before?" And it's like, well, you know, just because you haven't built the app before doesn't mean you're inexperienced at creating user interfaces. So the fact that we had to have always have previous experience I, I don't think is uh, necessarily true you know there's something to be said about having a fresh pair of eyes in and uh, obviously they're the domain expert but you know we can we know the platform we know the tech we know the experiences so we know what to add and how to make it better they just need to be able to execute from their side as well and uh, we can come together but you know some some don't quite see the value I'm having a bit of a moan, yes. <laughs> I <would say> so. <laughs> but just to say that we are really good at our job. <laughs> so the, the value proposition is to help customers sell more. What we deliver is typically a, a piece of software, right? But how do we, how do we get there, right? Um, we talk about uh, this, this four-step service model. So, so we, we help customers um, discover unmet needs. Uh, and that is typically uh, through design research, um, journey mapping, et cetera, et cetera. Um, once that is done, we, we help uh, our customers through product discovery and design sprints to define what the product needs to be, what the requirements are, uh, what the um, uh, 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 success metrics needs to be, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what, what should the funnel be? Um, Three, we sit down, we, st- we staff a team, a cross-functional team of designers and engineers and, and testers to, to actually uh, create the first version of the platform, either, either as an MVP or as a, a first version, uh, version 1.0, if you will. Uh, so we get something up and running as soon as we can. And then maybe this is another thing that makes make a little bit different because uh, we typically also stay with that product post-launch for years after um, continuously improving and maintaining it. Uh, so you, you mentioned the um, the electronics retailers, for example. That's a typical example. We 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 didn't just go through discovery and and and, and build the platform. We actually have a team uh, working to continuously improve the platform and make it better and better over time. Working very closely with the customer. So so. Um, uh, you know, going back to, to, to make an argument for specialization, um, you learn a lot uh, seeing what works and what doesn't work um, and to continuously improve and, and make a product better based on user input and analytics um, is a constant source of, of experience and expertise uh, that we can bring with us to the next uh, endeavor.
Right. What makes then you guys different from other agencies that just builds websites? Yeah. How do you how do you different? How are you different? I guess. How do you think you're different? I think a, a while ago we wouldn't have been that different, um, but I think I'm going to blow my own trumpet here. Um, <laughs> is that's that, the purpose um, of the video? I guess. I, I think <laughs> it's your podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> go for it. ah, true. Uh, I, I think one of the things, anyway, let's say one item, maybe you added more, is uh, something that I, I did a, um, a talk to the to the team a while ago about sticking the landing. Um, that's one factor. Uh, sticking the landing meaning that you know if you've ever seen a gymnast vault over a horse and um, they will land with two feet perfectly. No matter what happens in the air, they will land on their feet. That's the point. So uh, the premise is no matter how we start, no matter what happens in the middle of the project, it's how you finish. And so I encourage everybody in the in the company to finish what you start because that's what they will remember. Your clients will remember you for that. And so, you know, everybody's trying hard to to do the best work they can in the time that we have available. But at the end of the day, you have to stick the landing. So that's one factor. So we don't leave or drop our clients midway. And if I can add, I think I think um, so. So, so, so uh, I think I think that factor uh, item one comes back to trust. Uh, we we we. Well, I, you can check me on this, but but I think we hand more trust and autonomy out to the teams than most other organizations, and the teams return that in terms of ownership and accountability. So I think that's what sticking the landing comes back to. The the other part is uh, today we are one of the few companies in Southeast Asia that's, that focus on this thing that we call the experience commerce. So on the one hand, um, back in the day when we built anything, then it, there, weren't, there wouldn't be made very much of a differentiation, uh, but today there is. So um, from a cusp perspective, the difference is twofold, right? On the one hand, it's expertise and specialist specialization, and on the other is the trust and ownership and accountability. So those two things combined. That's pretty cool. When I decided to join Make and then after working at Make for a while, I think that was really the one of the key points. Um, I was working on a project and there was a problem with the project. Um, but with Make's support, uh, we actually, even that I think we were making a loss at it, but we decided to still complete it and still do a good job at the end for it. And um, I think it was that support to actually um, complete it that impressed me about what Make cares the most about which is the completion of the project and that we actually do our best um, regardless of what happens. Poor feeling to be uh, dumped by uh, a vendor or a client. So, um, which happened to us actually recently by another vendor who wanted to pull away because they had resources allocated to another project and uh, we, they didn't finish the project. And it was a very so big sore point for the team um, to feel that way. So you don't want that to, ha to happen to anybody else. So Exactly. So I think it's, it's almost like the question of um, to test a man, you give him power. And, and to test an organization is when there's trouble, when there's a problem. And then you see how they deal with the problems. And that's what I've seen. Uh, so working at Make, that's what I found really um, why I like working at Make is that I know we will always deliver something great for the customers, so I wouldn't feel like, oh, we're going to leave them halfway because we underquoted or we ran out of resources. But no, indeed, we will push through for the client no matter what. So that gives me a confidence of like talking to the client, like this is the project that we will deliver you and this is what we will do. And I will always feel confident that we will always deliver regardless of the situation. So that's what's great about working at Make, the question you were supposed to ask me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so moving on, <laughs> how does it make work? Um, okay, that's a very broad question. <laughs> no, no, but uh, yeah, well, I, well, I can so I, I can answer it in in a in a uh, um, in a different way uh, as opposed to to physically how we do things, right? So, right. so um, we have this thing called the trifecta. Um, 
and it it so basically from since, since a few years back we defined success for the organization uh, according to three criteria uh, customer satisfaction employee fulfillment and company profitability and and success basically means uh, continuously improving all these three at one time um, how we do that depends on what we're trying to achieve so on, on, on the customer satisfaction part it would be um, uh, uh, continuous discovery, unmet needs, uh, continuous improvement, uh, rapid prototyping, etc. From a fulfillment point of view, it's autonomy, it's uh, focus on mastery and learning, it's about professional development through coaching and mentorship, um, putting a lot of effort on uh, and uh, effort and, and energy in terms of um, uh, feedback, feedback culture. On a uh, profitability and um, trying to build, measure, and learn as much as we can. Uh, we like measuring things um, mm -hmm. um, to a fault sometimes. <laughs> um, but we and, and we've we've uh, more recently tried to codify some of these these processes that we have in, into a our own operating system called MOS, which which uh, we talk about publicly all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but but the, the emphasis has always been, and, and I think I I, I, th I think I speak for both of us when I say that when it comes to process and 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 policies, it's just enough. Like we 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 don't want process, we don't want policy, but we realize that as we are growing, we're, we're you know hitting a hundred people, etc. We do need to have some guidelines in place at least, and so that's where the MOS comes in, etc. I think um, this is. I asked. I I was um, recent. I'm least recently listening to um, uh, what's the book's name again? I don't know. Netflix. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, no rules. No rules. rules. Yeah. And uh, I messaged Andreas and said, "A lot of this stuff I'm seeing in here sounds a bit like make. Like, yeah. I were you inspired by it?" Uh, and and I asked that question. So maybe you could use this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, Netflix has been an inspiration. Um, uh, Basecamp has always been an inspiration. Yep. There's a bunch of companies, like, uh, Google, for, uh, you know. But there, and there's a lot of other more obscure um, organizations that we've looked at in in recent years as well for for, for inspiration. They, I, I don't think there's um, there's no hard and fast rule, but it's it's always interesting to see what other people are doing and then seeing contextually what makes sense for us. Because mm -hmm. um, obviously Netflix is a very different organization than we are. Um, Google too, um, Basecamp too. Um, but but you, there's there are similarities between all those things. Yeah, like the unlimited remote work or how we started with one day remote work mm -hmm. um, and then we moved on to unlimited one. I think that, that, that comes back to um, autonomy and freedom. I think that you know the the core values of the company: um, purpose, growth, uh, freedom, and humility. Is you know it's 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 all part and parcel of that. And so, giving people the freedom to work where they want, when they want, as long as they are responsible, get the work done, and communicate. Um, what more do you need? You don't need to put them in a tin can or an office all day. Uh, we would like them to be here because it's kind of missed them. But, you know, they don't have to be there. Uh, they have to be at the office. Um, but, you know, the, basically, I think we give out what we expect as well. You know, so what we would like to have is what we give out. Right. And I think um, as closing to that, I would also like to add that I don't know if you realize because you guys run the company, but the, the word that you use, happy people to good work, I think that's an amazing uh, model that you use that I will keep remembering make for. It's a defining word for me about yeah. working at Bank. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the first the first website we ever had just mm -hmm. said happy people do good work. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, like you know, I mentioned before, like when we when we started, we didn't have a grand vision. Uh, we we but we had that. That was like the the thing that we bonded over, saying this is what we want to do. Um, and then, uh, you know, the mission right now to to literally change how the world works. That came up came into 2016, but it's built on, you know, a couple of years of thinking about what, what makes people happy at work, um, why is it important, and, and what, what change do we want to see, etc. Yeah. The initial precepts that we had, there was a rotating on the, uh, the website, it was 
out of, out of sight, but not out of mind. Oh. Happy people do good work. There was like a bunch of these that we had written on the website. So, yeah, we wrote a manifesto before we started the company. So that's, that's, and happy people do good work was the one that stuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe for the benefit of, I think people will ask these questions. I think my dad would ask this question um, as I'm thinking how I explain the company to my dad, because uh, we used to run a tight ship uh, Chinaman style and, and you know we want to make profit from it so how does this relaxed environment and giving so much trust to people is it really that does it really make you more efficient so this is, this is such a loaded question. I, I don't know how, how long do we have like, you know? um, can, can, can I can I try and then you can you can fill in sure. so so fundamentally I think I think there's plenty of research that shows that um, a decentralized organizational structures over time leads to more profitability and better performance. But the way there is uh, not easy. And uh, actually, if you, if, if you might remember, the, if, since you read the No Rules Rules book recently, I think they, talk, they have examples in there where too often when they, you know, let, let's say that you have a um, no, no vacation policy policy. And there's one person out of a hundred who uh, abused that policy. The knee-jerk reaction then is to put policy back in to stop um, abuse from happening. And of course, then you're punishing 99 people who had no issues with the whole thing. And so, so what, what's so difficult of, of moving in that direction is to stay principled and not submit to these knee-jerk reactions and putting policy in place just because that one person Abused. Uh, well, it, it, sometimes it's not even abuse. Sometimes it's just they made a mistake, right? right. So you just let's talk to the person, correct the mistake, but don't don't put policy back in. Right. Um, it's like um, I think we, we we spoke about this a few a few days ago. This um, notion of uh, enabling versus governing constraints. Like most organizations say, here's what you can do. Uh, th- you know, you have you have your little box, and then um, anything outside this box is prohibited. Whereas what we try to do is saying, um, there are a few things you should not do. You should not steal, lie, and cheat, etc. Everything else is f- is fair game. You just uh, you have a you have a task, you have a KPI, you have whatever to to fulfill. However you go about doing that, it's absolutely fine as long as you don't do you know cheat, steal, and lie. Um, and 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 it, it's just it, the the freedom to create is much much greater and. You are also future-proofing the organization because all of a sudden, no matter what what um, the world throws at you, you can you can respond because you're not handcuffed to these you know little little job description that you were given four years ago that has never updated, right? Um, so yeah, so I don't know. So long story short, yes, there's <laughs> there's research showing that it leads to better results. I think maybe to add on on to that, I think. Um, this was mentioned at the Tech Force conference as well, um, when they were talking about um, the culture code and other things like that. Um, you know, you you want to when you have roles, heavy roles in the in the company. What you end up is that you have people that are they don't think. Everything is defined for them, and you want people to have that creative freedom to make a decision. And we're not micromanagers by any means. And so we don't want to run the company by telling everybody what to do. We want it to be fairly organic and autonomous, right? And therefore, you need to have people that can think for themselves and not go to the rule book whenever they can't break a decision, you know, hit a tie break or can't, can't figure it out. And that creativity just... I think that's what adds value to the work at the end of the day. So is there efficiency in it? I think there is. Is there drawbacks to it? I think there is as well, but it's pros and cons, right? So um, I think we gain more than we lose. Let's put it that way. It's like a company like Netflix or, or Make, effectiveness is good. If you are producing cement, efficiency is better, yeah. right? Uh, but we're not producing cement, last I checked, so we should probably not try to do that. I guess if you, if, you, if you think about it, and maybe some people don't really see this, is that we, you know, we create experiences, but we're also a software company. And software isn't black and white. Uh, there's an element of artistry to writing code, right? It's not perfect. It's written by humans. So 
to solve problems, you need that creativity, but you do need the efficiency, right? There's deadlines to me. So um, people do need a, a element of creativity to solve problems quickly, but they also need to be efficient. But, you know, so there's a, there's a balance, I think that's what I'm saying. Um, so, you know, while, while we might lean towards being, you know, flexible, no, not no rules, but less rules, required rules, um, you know, we, we still have to strike a balance and, and that's the, uh, that's the challenge. Awesome. So I think that was a really long answer to the question number six. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bra bra brace yourself. More is coming. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is the last one. Uh, what are makes plans for the future? When, when you say future, how, how, what, what kind of time frame are we talking about? I think we are talking about... Okay, can, I, can I define the, the time frame? You can please define the time frame because I didn't define the question. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, well um, uh, so, so we, we, we like to think long term. Um, the, 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 we, we work uh, in three months to six months cycles, so it's very short term. But in terms of vision, it's a decade or more. Um, when you look at things from that point of view, uh, the only thing you can really be sure of is that you don't know what's going to happen. And so, so what we're trying to do now is to, to build an organization that can uh, grow with the time and, and you know, sense and respond to, to environmental change. Um, how? Um, that's a very long answer to that too, but it, like stuff that we talked about before, like no, no little rules, decentralization, autonomy, um, uh, ownership uh, to, to the individuals. Um, and as, as you well know, that has led us down this path to set this insanely aggressive target to create um, 100 Turn, turn 100 makers into dollar millionaires by the end of the next end of this decade so another 10 years but by the time we turn with the company turns 20. um uh i I, th I think it's achievable it's definitely a, a moonshot you know for us but but um by by uh decentralizing and redistributing uh, wealth and equity within within the organization we think we can we can get there faster than most others and uh, you play an important role in that because your your company Pareto is the first one out so um, how does that feel I think that was a really good idea and I really liked it because well, at first, I didn't think it was a good idea because I, you know, I used to run startups and then I, I got a little bit tired running them. And it's like, okay, I'm going to run startups again now. Um, but then I saw the important point uh, was the running micro enterprises within uh, Make um, helps diversify the company. And, and, you know, having seen what happened during the COVID um, to different people and different organizations, I feel it's important to be diversified, di di to have diversity, to be able to withstand different types of situations. I mean, COVID is one type of situation, but there could be other other situations. And I think um, having different types of products that we can start selling, I think it does many things. And I think um, I'm I'm also enjoying being in an agency because there's so many different different type of projects. And I think that's also what makes people stay because we they they don't have to stay in a company but they do one thing but in an agency you can do many different things depending on what the projects come in and i think by diversifying that actually increases even more of that and that gives us um all the different type of skill sets as well and also the opportunity to work with different things and for me um uh, running the pareto micro enterprise <laughs> Um, has helped definitely uh, increase more interest and more passionate passion about working here at Make. Gives me uh, renewed uh, um, hope about the future of Make as well for the things that you're doing. For example, different partnerships that are coming in that we're working on. I think that's really interesting. And that just gives so much more... Um, I can see there's so much more future in terms of the road of make, not just another development agency. There's so much more things that could happen. And I think that's exciting. And that's, I think that's cool. Got wind of that firsthand, didn't you, yesterday? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, uh, TechSource released their, um, uh, sorry, they uh, announced their, officially their um, accelerator. And so that is one potential partnership that we're gonna try and push down. And also we met our other partner, well, in progress, um, which is Stripe. 
it's from Thailand. So one of one of many things that we're trying to push forward to to broaden our range a little bit and uh, and uh, offer value. Basically, that's really it. Okay, so I think that covers most of the important points. Um, I don't know how to close this like a YouTuber, but <laughs> basically, I think some of the keywords will be um, hit, like hit subscribe. Hit, hit subscribe. I don't know where you're gonna put the button, but hit subscribe and like. If you have questions and and, and comments and, and anything, uh, you can email it to hello at make dot com. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Our first podcast. Okay. Stay tuned for more. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>